Welcome everybody to this second in our series on the future of development. I'm Shanta Devarajan. I'm a professor at Georgetown University and a non-resident fellow at the Center for Global Development. And it's my pleasure to uh, moderate this session. Today's theme is health. And in particular, the question is, what will it take to achieve universal health? And I'm delighted that we have uh, two of the most distinguished experts in this area. Our main speaker will be Pascaline Dupas. Pascaline is a professor at Stanford University and the director, the faculty director of the Stanford King Center in Global Development, as well as a senior fellow at uh, CEPR. Uh, and I should just say that I'm really honored to have Pascaline because she's the kind of person who can uh, straddle many levels of abstraction. So she takes a big picture approach, which we will hear from today, and then she can drill down to a very specific uh, issue. Uh, and even, even at that point, she, you get the feeling that she really knows her data. Uh, the questions that you, when you ask her questions at seminars and the way she answers them makes you think, well, she probably knows every single family in that data set. Um, now, our uh, discussant is uh, Jishnu Das, who's a colleague of mine at Georgetown. He's a professor at the McCourt School of Public Policy, as well as the Walsh School of Foreign Service. And, and Jishnu is one of the, uh, uh, I would say, one of the most creative thinkers in this area uh, and has uh, done enormous work in both uh, health and education that has really shaped our thinking um, uh, about health and education in, in poor countries. Uh, but in addition, I would say that Jishnu has this sort of action part of him. He actually not only comes up with new ideas and estimates them and tests them, but he actually implements them too, uh, and has been involved in various exercises, including introducing uh, health insurance in, to inf informal workers in India. Okay, so, um, we have uh, Pascaline is going to start uh, to give her presentation for 25 minutes and then Jishnu will follow for 10 to 15 minutes. After which uh, we invite you, the audience to uh, pose questions. And there are three ways you can pose these questions. One is by email. Uh, uh, the email address is uh, 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 cgdev.org. Uh, you can also do it by tweet. Uh, the, Tweet, Twitter handle is at CGDev using the hashtag CGDTalks. Or you could just pose the question on the comment section of YouTube where uh, I assume you're uh, uh, watching. And uh, my colleagues, Ranil Desanayaka and Hannah Brown will then collate the questions and give them to us uh, to pose to the, to the speakers. So let me now hand it over to Pascaline. All right, thank you so much. I'm going to share some slides. Um, here we go. Uh, let me know if you don't see the slides. I'm going to assume you can see them. Uh, thank you so much. It's a great pleasure to be here. It's a great honor uh, to share the stage uh, with Shanta and with Jishnu. Um, I feel like, uh, you know, Jishnu is, is, is more of an expert than I am. So I'm actually very much looking forward uh, to his, his comments and to the discussion. Uh, I'm gonna talk um, about health, as you know, and I wanted to start with something very, very trivial, something that you all know, but I think it's always worth uh, repeating, that health uh, is a human right. Um, it's a key component of well-being through two main channels, a direct channel, when you have um, health, when your loved ones do not suffer, do not die, you are much um, you know, happier and better off. So we can think of health as an end in itself, it's a consumption good. But health also contributes to well-being in an indirect way through um, its um, effect on your ability to um, have income. Uh, to anyone, what this means, uh, we are all, you know, uh, eminently aware that um, you know our neighbors' health uh, matters for ours in many ways. Uh, whenever we are thinking of a communicable disease, but I also think of health as creating externalities in many other dimensions. Think of you know the tourism industry in Sierra Leone following Ebola crisis. Okay, <laughs> obviously uh, it's gonna be tricky for a country that has a, health, a high health burden to attract uh, you know, investors, to attract uh, you know, tourists and to get going on other uh, dimensions. And finally, health requires expertise 
in the sense that you know the you know, people who are able to provide healthcare um, need to be trained in a way that needs to be uh, regulated. Not everybody can be a doctor. You have to get a formal license. Uh, it's something that's going to be uh, you know uh, limited supply. And so for all these reasons and and possibly some others, you know health cannot be left to the market forces. It's going to require government participation and. Uh, sometimes even international cooperation as, you know, right now uh, with a pandemic like COVID. So uh, when we think about the future of development, the reason why I think health is one of the, uh, you know, domains that uh, you, you guys have chosen to talk about is because there are still some huge differences across countries in health levels. And obviously these differences are very much related to uh, income. Okay, so this is just showing from our World in Data uh, series, the GDP per, ca per capita um, against life expectancy. And it's very clearly um, the, uh, the fact that, you know, the richer you are, this is the log scale on the X axis, the richer you are, the longer the life expectancy. Okay, so there's still a gap of about 20, 25 years in life expectancy between, you know, the richest countries in the world uh, and the poorest countries in the world. Now, there is some good news actually, which is that if you look at this relationship, which is called the Preston curve, you know, this relationship between life expectancy and income as a name, it's called the Preston curve. The Preston curve has been going through an amazing rise. Um, this is showing you the same data, but now it's not a log scale anymore, okay? Um, so that's why it has a different shape. But what you can see, this is the Preston curve of 1800. This is a Preston curve of 1950, 1980, and 2012. And what's remarkable about this is that if you you know take a point here you know if with uh, 30 to 100 uh, GDP per capita back in 1900 you could essentially live you know up to on average you know 43 years old whereas this, with that same amount today you can live up to 65 years old okay that's uh, like you know you can actually get 50% um, extra uh, years of life with the same in same income today as you could um, back then. Um, and if you just focus on the last you know, 60 years, if I may say, um, you can see that uh, the richest countries in 1950, which were around here, could live up to 70 years. And now um, to get there, you only uh, need, if I may say, uh, about a third of that same uh, income. Okay, so it's really remarkable how you know, we've been able to uh, live longer with less income than in the past. This, this rise of the Preston curve is, is really uh, phenomenal uh, news. Um, and uh, the, it, it's important to try to think about how these things um, have happened. How did we get so much catch up? Because if you actually, there's another piece of this graph I forgot to highlight, which is that, you know, you can see this great convergence in terms of life expectancy um, when you, when you, uh, you know, look at this uh, graph. But you can also see that, you know, the scale um, in terms of GDP per capita has also spread out, okay? So actually a fact that also you can find, um, you can notice from this graph is that the health convergence in the last 60 years has been much stronger than income convergence. So how does that come about? Well, if you look at, you know, the main sources of improvements in health over time, um, they've come from three sources. First, and that was, you know, the case in, in uh, Western Europe uh, and in its offshoots, uh, they are called, was an improved standard of living. People started making more money thanks to the industrial revolutions and especially nutrition improving, okay? And then there was uh, big public health investments, which, you know, are, 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 are you know, more um, possible um, when incomes rise. And in particular, uh, countries, and it's well known in, in, the, in the U.S., uh, with this paper by Cutler and Miller, but invested in, you know, clean water sanitation. And a lot of the cities in particular that had uh, bad sanitation benefited from this huge uh, infrastructure investments, and that contributed to a large share of the decline in mortality uh, at the beginning of the 20th century. And then, as you all know, with the sulfa drugs uh, in, the third, in the 1930s, and then penicillin in the 1940s, and then medical you know, advances in surgery uh, in the middle of the 20th century, all these medical innovations led to um, a big, uh, big improvement as well. Okay? And you can see this uh, from this graph, um, this, uh, you know, the effect of antibiotics, uh, pretty drastic. This is a, a graph from the Cutler et al. Uh, 2006 JPE paper. Um, the, it makes sure this is in the U.S. Uh, really going down, you know, first in the 30s and then 40s, 
um, and and throughout um, and by you know the the sixties essentially we were close to the level we are at now. Uh, compared to non-infectious diseases, you know, uh, where the, the decline came a bit later, uh, thanks to advances in surgery, okay? Um, so in high-income countries, these three things happen really in this order. You know, people start getting more money, they were better fed, and then there were these public health investments, and then some, these medical innovations, okay? And again, you can see this in the U.S. from 1800 to 2020, um, the decline starts, the, this is child mortality, okay? Uh, it starts declining uh, already in the middle of the you know, 19th century. There's a little bit of a, of a, of a lull here. Um, and in part is because of people moving to cities, which initially were actually worse for health uh, until there were these innovations I talked about and then a big uh, decline thanks to these public health investments and then other medical innovations, okay? Uh, now in catch-up countries, the order was different. What happened in catch-up countries, what I mean by catch-up countries, essentially the poor countries today that have uh, benefited a lot from this uh, medical innovations, they kind of you know, leapfrogged, if I may say. They benefited from these medical discoveries uh, in high-income countries. Um, so, so they now have also you know, have access to antibiotics, vaccines, um, but, but they didn't actually do much of the first two. Um, there's, you know, it's not like they had massive improvements in nutrition, or in maybe a little bit, but and not, not, not everywhere. And definitely, step number two, which is public health investments, uh, we haven't seen them yet. Okay, so it's not to say that it was a mistake to immediately adopt the medical emissions. Obviously not. It's wonderful that there could be this, you know, technological spillovers and the great gains from that. But you know what I want to point out is that it doesn't mean that you know we don't need um, number one and number two. Uh, to take place in order to get uh, health uh, to be uh, to be there for all. Okay, so um, before I, I, I go to that point in more detail, this is just to show the remarkable gains uh, that we've seen in in poor countries in the past three decades, in particular. Um, this is focusing on South Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, and comparing to you know high-income countries, the change between 1990 and 2017 for child mortality. Uh, and between 1919 and 2015 for maternal mortality, this is the data I could um, find. And it's really you know, remarkable decreases uh, in mortality uh, in both graphs, okay? So I don't, don't wanna under, underestimate how much gain there has been. This is really wonderful, uh, wonderful uh, news. Um, now there are you know, some uh, uh, folks out there like to count things in terms of DALIs, uh, disability adjusted life years. It's kind of like a way to put you know, um, all of the health burden under one unit that we can compare. Uh, we, could, you know, we can argue about whether that's the right way to do it or not. But just for now, I just wanted to use that tool to show that uh, people have been also uh, in a different way documenting improvements in global health by plotting between 1990 again and now, you know, 2019, um, this total count of you know the disease burden um, in Dallas and it's really been going going down uh, quite a bit. So that's the good news. Now because um, that's that's when you sorry that's when you standardize it by age. Okay, that's when you 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 um, uh, uh, essentially look at a given person in some sense. Um, what is the average burden that they face if you were to 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 kind of like hold. Um, uh, the, the, the age composition constant. But then, but then because the population is aging, because when you improve life expectancy, you have more elderly people and elderly people tend to have uh, a higher uh, you know, disease rate. Then you have find the total, you know, the total stock of DALIs um, is actually not going down, okay? Um, so that's a new concern or maybe not so new, but that people have, which is, okay, we have to start thinking about what aging is going to mean uh, in a lot of, uh, uh, I mean, around the world. So what seems top of mind for policymakers now? I mean, I've just shown you massive improvements. Um, the Preston curve have like, you know, really risen up, massive decreases in, in mortality, child mortality, maternal mortality in a lot of poor countries. There's a sense of like, okay, we've, we've, we've done a good job. We've turned a page. We said we were gonna do the minimum development goals by 2015. We didn't quite get there, but by you know, 2019, just before COVID, we were feeling like pretty good about what was going on. Um, and people were thinking, what's next? And if I try to think of what seems top of mind for policymakers, 
what I see is a very strong focus on uh, access to quality healthcare for all. And a lot of countries, I've listed a few on the slides, India, Indonesia, Rwanda, Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire, many others have started or are trying to start um, state health insurance schemes. Um, the goal of these schemes often is to make sure that everybody has access to, you know, uh, basic, you know, at least a minimum amount of quality uh, of care beyond just uh, primary, okay? Because primary care has been heavy, the heavy focus for a long time. There's free primary care almost, you know, everywhere. And now the next step is how do we get people to get um, secondary tertiary care, you know, more advanced surgeries and things like that. Um, and so that's been, you know, something that a lot of the, the policymakers have been thinking about. A lot of, you know, economists have been uh, also studying, um, I count myself uh, among them. Um, uh, and, and we can, in you know, discussion, think about um, how far this, this, this can go. Um, there's also a lot of thinking about health systems design, you know, related to the, to the point above. And in particular, issues of, you know, performance of health providers, how to uh, increase their quality um, of uh, the outcomes uh, for people when they go through existing health structure. So that's a strong focus right now in the policy debate. There's also obviously uh, not immediate short-run concern uh, related to recovery from COVID. And uh, in particular, a lot of the newspapers right now, a lot of you know, think tanks working on global health have been very worried about the fact that COVID has really stalled a lot of the efforts that had been um, rolled out, especially on the vaccination front. Back in, in July, there was a very alarming statement uh, from the you know, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. They said, we've lost 25 years and 25 weeks. So I just showed you how much gain we, are, we saw in the last 25 years. So if we've really lost that, uh, it's, it's pretty dramatic. I think we still need to collect more data to know the extent to which that's true, um, but there's definitely a lot of concern. Um, and then in the long run, uh, as I just already alluded to, people are trying to understand, uh, thinking we really need to understand how aging shapes future health needs. Um, and the concern here are NCDs, non-communicable diseases. So here I just wanted to pause a little bit and say that, you know, if anything, if we look at uh, non-communicable diseases, um, you know, this is showing you the correlation between uh, these DALIs, again, uh, this way of like aggregating all of the burden of NCDs uh, against GDP per capita, um, and, you know, the relationship is there, you know, it's, 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 uh, the richer you are, the less uh, NCDs you have, but I wanted to point out that it's still much flatter than if I plot the same relationship with infectious disease uh, on the left axis, okay, and I'm not trying to fool you with different scales, you know, if anything, the scale on this one uh, is actually, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, bigger than on this one. Okay, so there is really a much still much stronger relationship between income and the disease burden from communicable diseases. So, my my um, my point here is that you know even though uh, you know increasing access to you know, secondary care, tertiary care, improving the quality of the healthcare system is you know really the first order thing if you want to help uh, deal with non communicable diseases. Um, I don't want people to forget about the fact that the communicable disease burden is still there, is still very uh, important and still the main driver of poor health in poor countries, okay? And so that's really the point I wanna drive home, which is that some big challenges remain that I think we need to look beyond uh, just health systems. First, there's just some malnutrition. This is just uh, you know showing you the share of the population that are undernourished as of 2017, again, thanks to the great uh, you know, maps that our world in data uh, puts out uh, that I found so useful each time I give a talk or that I teach. So thank you. If anyone from our world in data is, is watching, thank you so much for doing all this work. Um, this is, you know, showing that for still quite a number of countries, the share of population that are undernourished um, is, you know, above, uh, um, there is no vaccine. Um, there's also TB, which is a big deal. And um, these this diseases, as long as they are still around, they're just gonna you know, make it you know, very difficult for us to say that there is uh, universal health access. There's also a lack of access to clean water and sanitation. Um, and again, that's not something that the health system is there to provide. You really need you know, um, uh, the infrastructure to be put out there um, to, for people to have access to clean water, to have a tap at home. There are some other features of the environment that you know we barely talk about, but you know one of my colleagues at Stanford, Steve Luby, has been working quite a bit on things like lead contamination, which is a big deal uh, in South Asia. We don't always quite know where it comes from, 
um, you know, is actually found lead in turmeric, which is like a ubiquitous spice that people use for cooking. It turns out that there is lead in it. So that's like a really big deal. Something that, you know, again, it's not the health system that's going to prevent uh, turmeric to have lead in it. You need to have um, another type of recognition. And then, you know, people, even if they have running water, it's not going to have fluor, it's not going to have um, the salt that they're going to eat, often it doesn't have iodine. So a lot of the things we take for granted, uh, for those of us who are lucky to live um, in, you know, uh, OECD country, you know, we turn the tap, you know, the water is clean, it has fluor in it, you know, we barely need to brush our teeth. You know, there's nothing we need to do really, you know, except that, you know, to, to, to um, yeah, very to brush our teeth. I mean, there's like, we, we don't have to actually spend any time uh, paying attention to anything on, on our daily lives, except right now because of COVID suddenly, okay, we have to change our ways of doing, we have to put on a mask, we have to avoid shaking hands, we have to avoid seeing people. Now we are all taking uh, full conscience of the fact that when you face uh, a, a nasty environment, if I may say, you know, your daily life is completely uprooted. Well, for many countries around the world, you know, COVID is just like one little thing on top of many other things that is al already completely uh, shaping uh, their life on a daily basis. They have to spend so much time and effort every day preventing you know, um, infections from, from, from dirty water, infection from malaria, infection from all, you know, um, fishes uh, in the environment that they live in. Uh, and, and many, you know, arsenic in their uh, tube wells, many other um, things. So we need to fix the environment uh, for all these things. But on top of that, we need to make sure we don't make it worse. Um, and there are, you know, many dimensions in which things are worsening. Uh, air quality, uh, you know, is not is not great in many parts of the world, um, and uh, the the and climate uh, change obviously um, is something that no one can deny anymore. And we all know that the incidence of climate change is is going to be disproportionately uh, on the poor. Okay, uh, and in particular, the odds of highly unhealthy uh, extreme weather events is going to be, um, you know, disproportionately in, 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 poor, in poor countries. Um, so this is just like to say, we need to keep track of all of this. These are main drivers of people's health level, um, the environment that they live in. And it's not necessarily through the healthcare system that we can uh, fix those. And on top of all this, you know, I'm, I just wanted to highlight the fact that the health poor, if I may say, are actually getting harder to reach, okay? So a number of them are unable, uh, unreachable due to safety concerns. This is um, the fact that uh, poverty um, is taking on, uh, you know, different phases today. Uh, a lot of the poor uh, are in very poor countries, but they are in the poor countries that are, you know, called fragile and conflict affected, okay? So a lot of the poor and poor countries are hard to reach because of, of you know, they are they are in, in conflict, and then the other half of the poor are essentially non-poor countries. Okay, so they are non are not so poor countries, and so they are in countries where you know they are poor in part because the way the, the income is distributed within their country um, is, is 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 very unequal, and so you know that kind of changes quite a bit you know the narrative because you know as, as a lot of um, the poverty alleviation work that's being done, uh, you know, by huge players like uh, the World Bank, for example. You know, they have good models to work with countries, you know, that are poor but have like a, you know, a somewhat functioning government. But how do you deal with, you know, a, a government, a, a conflict, a conflict area, or how do you deal with a not so poor country that just doesn't want to do much about poverty alleviation? That's like much. These are much harder problems. Okay. Um, there's also, you know, related to the conflict issue, there's also forced migration. We have nearly 80 million people uprooted worldwide. Only about a quarter of them uh, live in, in camps. Um, you know, there are a lot of cons to being in a camp in terms of, you know, labor uh, rights to work and stuff like that. The only maybe, you know, silver lining of being in a camp is that you may be able to access healthcare uh, more easily because it's, it's a, you know, it's a way for the health um, Healthcare to reach people easily, but for the 75% of uh, people who are uprooted, 75% of refugees who are not in the camp, their ability to access healthcare is quite limited, and the ability of this you know, system, whomever it is, <laughs> to reach them uh, can be quite difficult as well. Um, I've already alluded to this you know, large inequalities within countries, the fact that many of the poor and the standard live in middle income countries, a uh, point that you know, Paige and Pandey have highlighted uh, you know, recently. 
Um, so, you know, this inequality within country is harder to deal with uh, in the sense that, you know, political economy issues obviously are, you know, front and center. And then there's also a lot of unequal distribution within the household, okay? And that, you know, there is no country that shows that uh, better, I think, uh, uh, you know, that than India, <laughs> where uh, if you look at the rise in GDP per capita, uh, over the course of the 20th century, it's been quite remarkable, <clears throat> and yet it has come with a worsening of, you know, the gender, the sex ratio. Okay, <laughs> so as come, as income uh, rise, as uh, you know, uh, resources rise, more and more households um, are doing well. Uh, some members within the households are not doing better, and stunting uh, among women and children. Um, as you know, essentially barely, uh, barely improved. Okay, and it's not just it's not just in India. Um, uh, some uh, some of Shanta's and Jisnu's uh, colleagues have shown that you know within Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, seventy five percent of underweight women and underweight children are found um, in non non poor um, uh, you know households. Okay. So, and just, I don't know if uh, I, I have time to show you uh, this, but with uh, Radhika Jain, um, a postdoc at Stanford, we've been doing some work uh, looking at one of the uh, India's uh, state health insurance, health insurance program that's in Rajasthan. And we've just looked at the share of the patients, you know, getting care through that scheme who are female. And we find very, very low, uh, you know, a, a very, very abnormally low share of female patients. Um, this is just showing you by age group, for a number of different diseases. This is, you know, chronic kidney disease, cardiovascular diseases, neurological disorders. The share of female is, you know, between, you know, sometimes it's below 30%, sometimes it's 30 to 40%. And this is much lower than what we know the prevalence of the disease is um, by, by gender. So, so we would expect based on the global disease burden data that, you know, about 50% of the patients for most of these diseases would be women. And we find that it's only about 30%. So, Essentially, this is evidence that there are like many missing patients, women who are sick but are not taken for care. Okay, so when this is a situation um, that you you're, you're facing, you actually have you know healthcare is available, uh, your households have more resources now than they had before, but they did choose not to avail these resources to you know women in the household, then you know it's much harder problem to crack uh, than when it's just like lack of access to care. Okay, so what I wanted to uh, say was, you know, I'm not sure we can go very far um, if, we are, if we focus only on what we know, you know, how to do well. And I've done a lot of work myself on the issues of, you know, subsidies, you know, for preventative health products, um, you know, subsidies for, for care through, you know, insurance programs, behavioral interventions, you know, with individuals, with providers, all this is, can improve access to some resources, it can improve access to prevention and curation, but, it can only go so far. And, if, and universal access to health is gonna require um, you know, universal access to a healthy environment. And by that, I mean, you know, very broadly, uh, reducing the disease burden, uh, preparing you know, cities so that when people move to cities, there's a massive wave of urbanization right now, they move to cities that are prepared, prepared to, to have uh, many more people um, and, and have like already, you know, the, the sanitation system put in place, the sewerage and all of that. But I also mean, you know, more broadly, we need to eradicate discrimination, we need to eradicate discrimination against women, against, you know, lower castes uh, in, 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 in India, against ethnic minorities. You know, I think of discrimination as part of the, of the unhealthy environment that keeps, um, you know, uh, millions of people uh, in poor health and obviously climate change uh, mitigation and adaptation, okay? Um, so I guess the you know the, um, I need to 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 wrap up in five minutes I think so uh, I'm gonna speed up a little bit but um, you know we've we, we've talked about um, the gains that have been seen um, through you know vaccinations uh, you know free distribution of bed nets water treatment solutions or as kids uh, you know free and easily accessible primary care. You know, all of this has been done under the, uh, the MDGs, um, uh, and this working on like the low hanging fruits. Now, the not so low hanging fruit that people are working a lot on right now, and Jishnu is an expert on this, so I'll, I'll let him uh, say more, uh, is improving the quality of the health service provision. And here, you know, there's one, one uh, thing that's not easy to do, uh, that maybe is not being discussed enough, is how to eradicate medical deserts. And by that, I mean areas where there's like no care. Um, and they are you know, parts of, uh, you know, especially rural areas 
Uh, I mean, there are many gold deserts in the US. <laughs> this term is being used in the US. So it's not uh, specific to, to poor countries, um, but people who are in medical deserts in the US have maybe better access to transportation uh, to you know, access the non-deserts and people uh, in poor countries. And so you know, trying to make sure that uh, you know, uh, there is uh, clinical uh, uh, medical capacity uh, even in the poorest part of the world is, is, is very important. But then once it's there, once you have a hospital and you have you know, surgeons uh, who can do the, uh, the procedures, uh, then you need to make sure that uh, you have management of human resources that uh, allows these uh, resources to be uh, really effective. And so issues of you know, provider absenteeism um, and whether incentives are gonna be uh, needed, uh, how to regulate the market, all of this stuff um, is really something that has been, there's been a surge of, of, of studies in the past uh, 10, 15 years. And, and again, uh, you know, Jishnu has done a lot of that uh, on that. So I'm, I'm looking forward to his, um, his thoughts on this. Um, but if I look at whether, you know, this stuff, uh, how much of it matters, you know, there is this amazing data set, I think Jishnu was also critical in making it, uh, you know, come to life, that the World Bank has uh, started collecting a few years ago called the Service Delivery Indicator Survey um, in Sub-Saharan Africa. And from that, you see, you know, from these different countries uh, that I put here, Kenya, Malaska, Madagascar, Niger, Tanzania, you know, some pretty, you know, uh, depressing numbers, if I may say. Uh, absenteeism, obviously, uh, is very large um, and, and, and very concerning. Uh, diagnostic accuracy, you know, it's not too bad in Kenya, 72%, but super low in some other countries. Uh, you know, process quality is low. There's a lot of, um, uh, of, of, of really disturbing numbers. But then if I try to like, correlate this with actual um, health outcomes, this is now showing you you know, uh, life expectancy adverse against the poverty headcount ratio. You see, Madagascar, uh, you know, is 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 um, you know kind of like super poor, uh, but it has about the same life expectancy adverse as Tanzania and Kenya. But if you look at this, uh, Madagascar is actually doing way worse than Kenya, for example, on most of these metrics. Okay, so how do they you know, somehow get to do uh, you know better on the life expectancy? Obviously, I'm not asking. You know, this is not. A regression. This is just like you know, uh, just a few points. But just to say, it's not obvious to me that um, the metric, the 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 the, the healthcare quality uh, is 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 going to be uh, first order in terms of of uh, getting people uh, to be healthy. So you know, in my last uh, couple of minutes, I'm going to say, let's not forget about you know eradicating the big diseases. Okay, I want to make a plea to put my education back on the table. Uh, and, and make a, a plea to uh, the fact that you know it's very important for whoever is like a buddy with an urban planner uh, in in in, uh, in 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 one of the many countries around the world that is uh, facing a wave of urban, urbanization. Please uh, try to uh, remind them that it's easier to install um, you know sewerage before uh, there are a million people living in a shanty town than you know afterwards. Um, and again, as I said before, we need to eradicate uh, discrimination and, and to really think hard about mitigation and adaptation to climate change. So a lot of these big ticket items are actually global goods. Um, and uh, it, it, you know, I think it's very important to think about that. Uh, this is not, we can't put the honest on the people <laughs> as much. Uh, and sometimes it's not even on, on specific governments as much. We really need to have a global effort uh, to think hard about ways to eradicate malaria, TB, um, and to deal with climate change, and to deal with, you know, asylum seekers. Like there are something called climate refugees these days. You know, it's like a huge driver of, of, of climate, of, uh, of uh, the, you know, forced migration. Uh, who is responsible for climate change? It is not, you know, the, the, the governments of the countries that people are fleeing. Um, it's, uh, you know, the global community. So we need to think about these this global goods. Now, obviously, there are also some national level policies. And so what I was talking about, you know, preparing for the wave of urbanization, um, eradicating discrimination, this, you know, require more, you know, national level policies. Obviously, at both of these levels, uh, political will is going to be, uh, you know, a huge, a huge determinant of how far we go. Um, and at the national level, you know, state capacity is often brought up as a, as a, as a constraint, okay? Um, one, uh, you know, pet peeve of mine is, is uh, the fact that malaria eradication is something that people have dismissed you know, too much in my view. And I was very distraught one day when I asked uh, Jim King, the former president of the World Bank, you know, co-founder of PIH, you know, 
how about malaria eradication? He was still president of the World Bank at the time, and he looked at me like, what? That's, that's not even possible. Like, he had never thought of that. Like, if, if I ever had the honor to be the president of the World Bank, I would take it as like my, my legacy to the world would be to try to eradicate malaria. This had not even crossed his mind, and he's a medical doctor. So I feel like people have given up on malaria eradication in a way that uh, I, find, uh, I find very sad. So I think, you know, I want people to think harder about that, and TB as well, okay? And, and I want to highlight the, you know, PEPFAR as an example. I mean, PEPFAR, you know, we were all shocked that, you know, President Bush uh, actually signed that because this was, you know, uh, kind of surprising from, 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 from him to do something like that. But it turns out to have, to have been what some, some folks have called the most significant global response to a single disease in history. I think, you know, it's also the most successful U.S. foreign aid program since the Marshall Plan. It's been really, really amazingly, um, you know, wonderful at saving lives and, and preventing new infections in, in the world. And so I just want to call for, you know, a Marshall Plan against malaria. And, and maybe this time it shouldn't be the U.S., you know, maybe it should be the former colonial powers, France and the U.K. in particular. I don't think they've done anything close to PEPFAR. And uh, I think it's, you know, it would be a good idea for them to think about maybe doing a big, a big push on malaria eradication. Now, Bill Gates, with you know my best buddy when it comes to pushing for malaria eradication, doesn't think that this model of uh, you know a large-scale global campaign funded and organized by foreign donors and focused on a single intervention is the way to go for malaria eradication. He thinks that it's more from you know sub-regional or national immunization program that we can get there. And you know maybe I agree on the fact that it's not a single intervention that you need, but I, I disagree on the idea that it can be done piecemeal. I think this is really a global good. You, you can't, you know, it's a communicable disease. If Rwanda, uh, you know, eradicate malaria, they are not going to, you know, uh, stay malaria free for long. If, if if Uganda and the DRC haven't also eradicated. Okay, so I'm out of time. I see Shanta mute, uh, unmuted himself to kick me out of the stage. So this is my conclusion slide. You know. The good news is that health has improved more in the past 100 years than ever before, okay, including in poorest countries. Um, this is the result of this, uh, you know, development and spread of cheap, effective technologies. Um, what's next, you know, uh, I think my point of view was clear that, it, you know, we have to fix in many ways uh, or think hard about health systems and, and their design. Um, that's the focus of a lot of energy, but I just want to make sure that people uh, don't forget the big elephants in the room, uh, which concern the environment that people live in. Uh, we, need, uh, we need global coordination. We can't just expect the Ministry of Health to solve uh, everything. If we want you know, universal health, uh, we need the environment to be uh, universally clean. Uh, thank you very much. Well, thank you, Fuscaline. That's uh, wonderful. I really appreciate it both the rigor of your analysis and the passion with which it was delivered. So uh, thanks for both. Uh, let's, uh, let's turn to Jishnu. Uh, thanks, Shanta, and uh, thank you for a riveting talk, uh, uh, Pascaline. I am going to share uh, my slides, which I hope everybody can see. Uh, and I'm just going to discuss this for 10 minutes in terms of uh, a, a presentation I called Small G Has Run Its Course, uh, and hopefully that will become obvious as we go along. So my take on, on Pascaline's argument is, you know, kind of threefold. One is that the world is a healthier place to live in. In high-income countries, we had an established path. It started with kind of better nutrition, uh, you know, went down to big government public health, and then eventually better medicine and an ability to access better treatment. Right. What I find often interesting in this, in, in, in the way that this happened was, you know, in fact, uh, if you map this to what we think about as market failures that the market can't provide it, both of this big government public health and access to better treatment uh, have market failures associated with them, in particular, you know, like with COVID, uh, there are externalities. And when it comes to hospital care, there are big failures of insurance markets. But nevertheless, the big declines in mortality were really due to these, these things here, right? And let me show you a striking picture along the line that Pascaline had. This is for tuberculosis, which unfortunately, the country like India is still, you know, a, a big burden of a big reason for uh, uh, mortality. You know, most of this is kind of where, you know, public health really matters. And it's the biggest decline that you can see. This is where streptomycin comes in. Incidentally, it was trialed in 
India, uh, but most of the decline in PB has already happened by then, right? And those continue to happen uh, uh, due to better public health. So at most, we can attribute only a tiny portion of the decline between 1860 and, uh, um, and, and 2020 due to better medicine. Most of it was due to better public health. Uh, and, and I'm going to include these references and hyperlinks throughout my slide, but not necessarily talk about them. But the, the McEwen's book is, is really phenomenal on this. So then Pascal's the second part is, look, in low-income countries, this has happened a little bit, but it's mostly income base. This has been a big failure, right? We have never really tried big government health, right? And this part, well, it's kind of worked. And what's been encouraging is the rapid tech transfer that we've seen from you know, high income to low income countries and sometimes from low income to high income countries like for you know, artisanin for malaria, uh, for falciparum and malaria. But primarily it's the rich who benefited from this. The poor somewhat, but maybe you know, uh, uh, much more limited. And you know, if we shrink that picture and we start to think about what's the consensus that built up from 2000, it was that big government does not work in low-income countries, right? And it led to what I think about as an inverted model of healthcare. We said, we're going to privately provide what was always provided as big public goods. You know, we are not going to have clean water systems. We are going to have chlorine dispensers. We are not going to have sanitation systems. We are going to have pit toilets. We are not going to have malaria elimination. We are going to have bed nets. Right? We're not going to have better housing conditions. We're going to have vaccines. And now in Delhi, we're not going to have clean air. We're going to have air purifiers. Right? Uh, and on the other hand, we've argued for public provision of private goods. And, I'll, and I actually think that primary care investments, for a lot of reasons, are more private than public goods. But hospitals where big insurance failures and big problems of, of lack of insurance of the households are very salient have just been left behind. Right? And in this model, the way I view kind of Pascaline's work is, and, and, and this presentation is in part, right? These small government investments did drive progress, right? So if you about a table about this, I call this the small G to the big G table. It's kind of saying, look, without investment, you know, you get some stuff with small G and with investment, you get, you know, maybe 10 or so, and you could get more. We also know that, you know, we also have pretty good evidence that, you know, big G without investment, without thinking about what you want to do, doesn't actually get you much, right? And in fact, we've been very good over these last 20 years, you know, mapping out these three parts of the quadrant, right? What we've been less good at is saying, what does this look like? What does this big question mark here kind of look like, right? Uh, and, and the last part of Pascaline's argument is maybe small g has really run its course, right? And she argues for three, for four different things. I don't mean to put social determinants down, you know, down there. It's just something to do with the formatting. But I do want to point out one thing on the sanitary cities, which is that the locus of ill health is really shifting from rural children to urban adults. And we don't have much data on this. So one estimate that I found was life expectancy of males in Mumbai is 52. And in the slums where 50% live, it's 44, right? So we're really talking about adult mortality in cities becoming a big, huge issue. And there's a hyperlink study here using DHS adult mortality data for sub-Saharan African cities that shows actually like in the industrial age, the, the, the mortality, adult mortality is higher in SSA cities compared to rural areas, right? So that's part of it. But Pascaline's also arguing for these big G public goods around you know, uh, population provision, malaria eradication, clean air, as well as thinking about donors and public goods, global public goods that take care of externalities across, across countries. So what's my take on this? I'm gonna argue four things in, in five minutes. So this is gonna be uh, interesting. I'm gonna argue that, you know, I'm going to acknowledge that. So, so I under I believe, like Pascaline, that small G has run its course, right? And I'm going to argue this in four parts. And I think this is the the argument that really needs to be uh, 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 kind of fleshed out. Part one is I'm going to acknowledge that the argument for as is small G is very persuasive. Part two, I'll show you that the argument for small G investments is less so. Right? It cannot solve deep problems of equity. It cannot lead to the big improvements we need. 
then I'm going to show you that part G is possible and can work well, right? And I think the big the big part there has the eye opener has been COVID, uh, which you know I've been working in India and Pakistan quite systematically during this time, and I've been shocked at just how well and how hard government functionaries have worked in these countries during this time. And I, I, I pick India and Pakistan in a way because the problems of state capacity have been pretty clear here, but also like in the U.S. You know, big G, big government can be systematically destroyed to produce totally abysmal outcomes, right? And part four is to emphasize that big G is not just more government, it's more and more effective government. And here, I think my, my take is very different that the transition from small to big G has to be managed, right? Uh, there's a question of getting the narrative right. There's a question of figuring out what big G does not imply. So I'm in favor of saying, we don't know how to do big G. Let's start small, understand this stuff and then expand. And trying to build what I call the DNA of big government first, right? So let me quickly take you through these and I'll stop. Here's the reason that the small government argument is persuasive. You know, Pasclean showed some of this. This is ongoing analysis of World Bank's SDI data. It has now almost 12 or 14 countries, some of them repeated. So a plug for that data as well. But here's absenteeism, right? I mean, it's between 30 and 40%. And then this is part of the work that I've been doing. You know, this is in Madhya Pradesh when we send patients to do doctor's clinics. Uh, the public sector, you know, these are private sector doctors. Many of them have no medical training. These are public sector doctors in their public clinics. And I just want you to focus on this. Uh, uh, they are doing worse than the untrained private sector doctors. But then you take the same public sector doctors and put them in their private clinics. And, whoa, they are the best in the entire system. Right. So you can come back to say this and say, hey, man, government doesn't work. Right. But the problem has been two things, that investing in small g is less so, not less o, for, for two big problems. One is, and, and this is a, a subtle point, but it's, it's been critical for thinking about stuff so we can come back to it. Private markets function by pricing variation, right? You get what you pay for and usually the rich can pay more, right? The problem when we have tried to put in additional big subsidies from government is these public investments distort these price incentives, worsening the functioning of the market. So at best, you can get these systems to kind of work if you invest in big G regulation, but you're going to need some kind of big government anyway. You'll either need to develop a regulatory big government or a provisionary big government. We have a lot of experience on provision of big government and where it fails. We have no evidence on regulation of big government and how it fails, right? The second problem is technology constraints. I, I, you know, It's cheaper to run a water purifying plant than to subsidize mineral water bottles for a billion people. So let me give you two, two slides here, and it's literally three more minutes and I'm gonna finish up. You know, this is data we have collected from almost 5,000 audit visits in, in the cities of Mumbai and Patna among private providers. And the histogram, th these things here, these are the prices they have charged our audit patients, right? And this is a measure of their quality, right? And you just see very clearly that the better, the higher your price, the better your quality. You're getting big gains. This is the fraction that you will be treated right, right? If you're going to the thousand rupee doctor, that goes up to about 80%. If you're stuck here at the 50 rupee guy where most of the poor are stuck, you're stuck at about 10%, right? So the market is pricing this in a pretty sophisticated and right way. What happens when the government comes in? And this is this wonderful paper by Radhika Jain uh, from Rajas, uh, working on data from Rajasthan. When we were designing this insurance program, we knew the biggest problem was how are you going to price these price these uh, 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 these these illnesses, right? We had no way of pricing it and working. You know, we worked on the theory for a year or so, and there is no way to price it. If you're going to have a single price, there is no efficient way to run this system, right? And you see this immediately. So here's a case where this particular date, Radhika shows the prices in the system changed, 
right? I, I'm not even going to try and pronounce this. Is tympanoplasty and tympanoplasmastiodectomy. But I cannot believe that the day they decided to change the prices is when people's year problems also changed. As they point, as Radhika points out in the paper quite clearly, you know, uh, what, what happened was uh, the, 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 the hospital just changed their coding of what they were giving. So suddenly this stuff became better reimbursed and whoa, you're going to give everybody that same thing. This stuff became worse reimbursed and you stop giving that, right? So here were these two poor patients who showed up with this one and they got this, right? Depending on what price you chose, right? The third part is big G can work, right? Uh, and, and, and again, the argument here is around COVID. In a country like India, the public sector has been responsible for testing, for management, for managing populations in their movement, and for generating data. And at one level, this worked surprisingly well in low-income countries. So, you know, if you look at Devesh Kapoor's idea about India in the Journal of Economic Perspectives, he says, we know that the state can work well in what they call mission mode for a little while, but it's really hard to work in mission mode for a long time. And I think COVID said, no, we can do that. We can do that for 18 months, right? It also showed like in the US that the retreat from big government can be extremely costly, right? Uh, so, you know, the way I think about it is we found out two things. We're finding that this 10, which we thought could be more is actually a fairly hard limit, right? We are not going to get to the big changes we need. And the second thing we are starting to open up to is maybe this number here that was a question mark before is closer to 50, right? How do we get there? And, and I'm just going to finish with this, which is, I think it's three parts and I have data for all of these, which we can you know, open up in the discussion. One is, I think the narrative for big G is fundamentally wrong. The reason is that people say, you know, the big G advocates say, look, the reason why you need big G is because the private sector is really bad. That's a terrible argument because they demonize the private sector, but the data does not support that. So what happens is somebody says, oh, the private sector is really bad. I come back with data, say, no, I'm sorry, it's better than the government sector. And it undermines the whole argument for big government, right? I think the right argument is, is, is that the private is usually better than the public sector where both exist. But that fact constrains the debate only because it shows that people can make reasonable choices, right? By design, the private sector can be priced for the market to function, right? And the private sector cannot provide large public goods like clean water without extensive regulations, which will require another form of big government anyway, right? So there's this famous quote that says, the private sector is more like the government sector in direct proportion to the subsidies it receives. And that's the problem, right? Second part, you know, I think it's really important to, 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 to narrow the scope of big government at the beginning. And we have three examples that we can talk about uh, in this part. One I do want to point out is people keep thinking that doctors are overworked. No, 70% of the typical healthcare workers day is spent not seeing patients. I mean, it's the biggest problem we have is tremendous excess capacity the world around. The average primary health care clinic in Nigeria sees one patient a day. This is the single biggest waste of expertise today in our, in, our, in our world, right? But we can talk about other ones as well. And the last bit is, you know, big G advocates often think about specific components, but I think we need to first focus on building the DNA of big G and the two that I wanted to mention for our discussion. I think trust and accountability are the key ones. Right? And again, COVID in the US has been one dramatic example. And there's wonderful work by Marcella Alsan, who has looked at both preventive and curative services and shown how trust is critical to this. And we've been doing work that shows equally interestingly that actually providers internalize low trust environments, right? And they in, internalize this low trust environment and behave accordingly, right? So almost never do we see providers recommending the right expensive treatment right away because they say, look, if I try that, the patient's just going to say, you're going to try and cheat me, right? So that's really been interesting for us to see. Uh, and, and, and the key issue of how do you develop that trust in the system is, is for me a big part of that DNA. 
And the second part, recognizing that once you have that trust in that system, you've also given the government the ability to abuse it. So the second part of that trust, you know, this is always the problem with reputation models. You build a reputation only so that you can extract some surplus from it at some point. Right. But how do you do that in a government which is infinitely lived? Well, you can't do it without accountability. Right. And I feel that this is a big problem because there's a lot of backsliding into authoritarianism in multiple settings. And we need to think about how that accountability will be provided. And the heart for me of that accountability is the availability of information and accurate information, which is why I dislike dallies enormously. And I can rant about that uh, with a slide, uh, 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 both by the media, which I think has been very important uh, in, in, in this last uh, uh, five years, and by academia. So I want to conclude here. I think there's building evidence that the next step will require these big government investments. I think we've all come around to that partly inspired and, and uh, uh, um, guided by Pascaline's uh, important work in this area. Uh, and I think getting there requires pretty careful and deliberate movement around a consensus. I think the big danger here is going to be overreach followed by, oh, that didn't work. We knew that big government is useless. Let's step back. I think that's the cycle that we need to really think about avoiding. So let me stop there. Thank you yeah. so much and uh, 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 pass it back to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jishnu. As, as, as always, provocative, but also very insightful. Uh, thanks so much. Um, it's interesting. The questions that have been coming in reflect a little bit where you, where you ended up. So let me ask a, a, a first set of questions uh, to both of you, um, which is uh, really, how do you prioritize among the many possible interventions? that you can start with? Uh, do you, uh, can you give us a sense of where you would start first and what would be the sequencing? What, what is more important than, than others? Because it's just, this is a big agenda that both of you have laid out. Um, so let me turn to Pascaline first. Um, yeah, it's, it's a tough question. I'm not sure that, uh, you know, they need to be done one by one. I think many of these issues uh, can be attacked, uh, you know, in parallel. Um, the, you know, the, the main actors for these different things, you know, can be different. I mean, if you think about, you know, uh, you know I've mentioned climate change being one of the big uh, driver of health going forward. I mean, that you can have a lot of action on climate, um, you know, climate change mitigation, uh, you know, in parallel to, uh, you know, separate efforts done by, you know, um, national governments trying to um, make large infrastructure investments to improve access you know, to, to clean water and sanitation. So I think that many, many different things can be done at the same time since they involve, uh, you know, different, uh, different actors. Now, maybe the question is for, you know, one government in a country thinking about, you know, what, you know, the various um, things that needs, they need to do um, and is there, um, is there, you know, is there a specific order? I guess I would encourage uh, uh, like a, bi a big push thinking in the sense that I think a lot of these things have, you know, uh, interact with each other. Um, and it's like maybe the returns to, you know, another aspect of the, of the big G that if you, you know, like do um, things Together, um, they, they, they may, they may, um, they may. I mean, there may, may be, you know, economies of scale to start with, and then also uh, interaction that work well. Now, Jishnu was arguing for the fact that if you do try to do too much at once, uh, you may just fail, and so we should, we, you know, we should start small. So I'm sure he has, uh, he has another tag on this question. Yeah, go ahead, Jishnu. So I think they're big and small principles. For me, the big principles are still going to be externalities and equity. Um, and I think, you know, in a country like India, tuberculosis is, you know, it, it's just rampant and it needs to be tackled. Um, so, so I would focus on things with externalities, clean water, sanitation. I think, unfortunately, that will push things like mental health down the agenda. And I think that's, that's important to make that prioritization. Right. Uh, on the other hand, the, the second part of it is equity and, and, and the standard public finance rule we follow is for equity, you subsidize the least income elastic commodities first. 
right? So I've often seen arguments saying, well, the poor are also affected by X. No, that doesn't really, that's important. But the part you need to know is if the poor are also affected by X, but what about Y, right? So for example, you know, if you look at hypertension, it's, it's roughly equally prevalent among the poor and rich, but tuberculosis is 10 times higher among the poor than the rich, right? So you want to start with TB because every dollar you go put there is much more progressive than putting a dollar in, 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 in chronic illnesses, right? I wish we could reach everybody and everything, but my worry is the moment you start that overreach, you will run into problems. So that's kind of one part of it. And the second is small practical stuff, right? Uh, you know, you can't have a system where you've put a doctor in a rural area in the middle of the Sahara and the person is seeing one patient a day. I mean, this is crazy. Right. And I think it's really discouraged doctors. It's, you know, uh, it's it's messed up the medical system like like like, you know, like nobody's business. And I think we need to think smartly about, look, there's a trade off there and we need to discuss that trade off with policymakers. We need to say, do you want to put them in an urban slum where they're going to see many more poor people or do you want to put them in the middle of the Sahara? Right. And I don't think there's a right answer because somebody is going to lose out. So I don't want to take that decision. But that is exactly what democracy is about. And I, I think our role is to is to say, here are the trade offs you face. There's one on the medical on the medical deserts, you know, what people tend to think, oh, let's bring doctors there. And when our alternative you say, no, let's move people out. You know, it's just like it's just like bring people to where they are uh, services. Um, and so migration policy is super important. Exactly. And, and Grant Miller has that wonderful paper showing how an ambulance system in India dramatically decreased perinatal mortality. And I think those are the kind of solutions that we need to find. Let, let me ask a question of the two of you, because I came up, came in my mind when I was listening to you, which is for, for the scheme to work, who is going to be held accountable for improving health outcomes in a country? See, one of, the, one of the reasons why there's been this focus on health care is, you know, you ask the Minister of Health, what are you doing about malaria? And he said, no, no that's sanitation. I can't, that's not my, in my bailiwick. And yet, that may be the most important thing to do to improve health care. So how do you change the way we, we, we structure this? And if, if you say it's a campaign to change the narrative, who should be in charge? And how do we make sure that they're, they're accountable for the right things? I wish I knew the answer to this question. The, <laughs> um, uh, I mean, in, in the case, like, in the case of COVID, for example, um, it's clear that it's you know the the, the leadership, like the very top, is like the you need you know coordination across you know all sectors, and it has to come from the from the very top. So yeah, ultimately, I think it's the you know the people at the very yeah. top. And th th the other example you gave of PEPFAR also yeah. was George W. Bush. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, now, uh, by the way, th there's a question in, in uh, implicit in the question, and this may be directed at Jishnu when you're talking about this these idle doctors or doctors uh, too many doctors, and is that. WHO projects a global shortage of 18 million health workers by 2030, mostly in low and middle income countries. Um, how do you reconcile that with the statements you were making about too many doctors? As I said, most doctors spent most of the day not seeing patients. Um, and I think the reason has been a fundamental lack of economic understanding uh, of how things work. Uh, you know, we don't have a rule that says we should have X many restaurants per 5,000 people. We have that rule for, for doctors uh, or the WHO recommends it. So, you know, if you were to sit and put a doctor in the middle of the Sahara, you know, there are only so many patients who can come to the person. Right. So we have landed up with a crazy situation where urban hospitals, where everybody is going, don't have enough doctors and rural primary care centers where nobody is going have have 
you know, doctors were not doing anything. And in fact, you know, there's some wonderful analysis that that was done in, in Lima by the World Bank uh, uh, showing that if you shut down 30, I think it was about 30 percent of the facilities, the average distance to a facility went up by six percent. Uh, sorry, six uh, six meters. Uh, 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 and so there, the, you know, the whole system is out of whack. I mean, and uh, sorry, I, I need to uh, share this one slide, which will make this point. Uh, uh, you know, uh, which is also from the STI, and I think that's that will be uh, uh, kind of helpful here. Which is just this one. Um, these are your your, your you know uh, histograms of how many patients are are seen, and that's about your 90th percentile in these countries, right? So, you know, on average, these places are seeing, you know, somewhere between, this is Nigeria and your one, um, uh, are seeing very, very few patients uh, in, 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 in their day. Um, we had one question that's a little bit off topic, but I'll, I'll, I'll read it to you and you can choose whether you want to answer it. Uh, it, quote, hello, I am representing Congressman Morell, Democrat from New York's 25th district. I'm wondering what changes to our current health care laws, ACA, for example, will expand coverage in the US? Additional, go ahead. Uh <laughs> you got there before me. I I give you the uh, privilege. No, I I'm actually a really strong supporter of things like Medicaid for all. I mean, uh, you know, I think that uh, uh, you know India has also gone down this line of private provision with uh, public financing. It doesn't work because the pricing is so complicated and it, it's it, it it's not there. So I'm in big favor of a public option. And Medicare for all, you know, I, I, I'm kind of a big supporter of that. I think having that public option is just critical. Um, and uh, uh, so, you know, there you have it. No, I think that's that's good. That's good advice. Um, okay, um, let's see. There's one other question I didn't quite understand. So. I wanted to Oh, oh the, 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 some people are raising the question of whether malaria and TB can be eradicated. Um, that they, they don't believe that it can be. Um, and you had, uh, Pascaline, you had suggested that they can be eliminated. Can you? Uh, yeah, I mean, obviously, I'm not, I'm, not, uh, I'm not an epidemiologist. Um, so I, but I, I, I'm not sure that. Um, we should give up yet. Uh, it, you know, it has been um, eliminated from many parts of the world uh, in the past, and there was a huge campaign, you know, after World War II, which was essentially DDT based, and then DDT was banned because of the negative effects it can have on the environment when it is used, um, you know, as a pesticide. And here the argument is that you know the pesticides are washed out uh, through the rains, going to the rivers, and infect the fish, and then you know the you know some 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 bird eat the fish and then comes nest and all of that. But um, you know when you use DDT spraying for malaria eradication, it's not outside; it's like the indoors uh, of the dwellings that are spread with DDT. So there's very little uh, contamination of the environment, um, and and there is no clear evidence that DDT, uh, you know contamination of, for humans actually in, influences their health in a negative way, definitely not, you know, as bad as, as, as malaria in any case. So uh, I think the, the case can be made that DDT, you know, which is extremely cheap, <laughs> DDT spraying uh, at scale has not you know, been, been tried. And there are some efforts right now, there's a big effort going on in the Southern uh, Africa area, um, you know, so, uh, the malaria has been pretty much eliminated from uh, from South Africa, and they are trying to push the frontier uh, north. Um, uh, you know, Botswana. There's like a plan um, that was made uh, maybe like 10 years ago to try to make progress. It's you know, it's it's it requires like concerted effort and uh, swamping, uh, dra um, draining the swamps. Uh, but between you know, the I mean, I think there are a lot of options that people have been discussing, like. Uh, 
uh, on top of DDT spraying, if you do preventative, uh, presumptive treatment of everyone with ACTs, I think that's a model that um, Mauritius has tried um, and has been, you know, doing quite well. So I, I think they are just we just need to uh, keep trying and and not just like think maybe there's just one one way to do it, which is DDT spraying, doing many things uh, at the at the at the same time. And you know, I'm, I'm uh, you know. Bill, Bill Gates um, and, and uh, Bill and Mina Gates Foundation have been uh, saying we can eradicate malaria by, by 2040. Um, you know, uh, so I, I and I believe that they have a lot of experts uh, on their side. So uh, I, I'm, I'm willing to, to keep hoping it's possible. Um, and, you know, for TB, uh, I don't see why. I don't see why it can't be eradicated. I mean, it was, you know, TB was extremely prevalent in, in Europe. Um, you know, Norway had like 80% of its population had you know, TB at some point and just completely got rid of it. I think it's, it's totally possible. And, and we have eliminated other diseases that we may have thought were yeah. uh, difficult, like smallpox yeah, small and, 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 poli yeah. and very yeah. close to it in polio now. Yeah. Um, so I think that, that's, that is more hopeful. Okay. Um, I think we've reached the, uh, the end. So I want to Thank both Pascaline Dupin and Jishnu Das for a very interesting and provocative discussion. I think it's both given us a very good sense of where the, 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 the state of the art lies in, in health in developing countries, but also what we need to do. It's given us an inspiration for the, for the future, so for, which is exactly what we're trying to do with this seminar series on future development, uh, just to say that the next seminar will be on finance with uh, Atif Mian. Um, so, uh, so thank you both and thank the audience for uh, their questions and their participation and uh, my colleagues at CGD for their help with uh, collating the questions. Uh, and I hope the, everybody has a good afternoon and weekend. Thank you so much, it was great. Bye.